The way I'd like to run this lecture is a little more like a college class and a little less like a sermon. Um, and because it is philosophy, I, I'd like to have uh, a bit of Socratic dialogue as we go along. So, so I, I want you to, have to ask questions as we go. Uh, so don't just wait till the end. At the end you can ask questions, certainly, but you can also ask questions throughout, please. Because I think there's a lot of terminology here that we might not be familiar with, so it'd be good to clarify all of those things as, as they come up, okay? And I'm kind of, I'm going to be a bit brutal with you. Um, I'm, um, my, my specialty is Thomas Aquinas, but as a historian of philosophy, right? So that means that I tend to focus on what Aquinas said and not on, not a, not on what I think, right? So I'm going to bombard you with texts of St. Thomas today. And we're going to try to get from there uh, some conclusions and applications uh, to liturgy in our current day. So, uh, yeah, we're going to read a lot of St. Thomas, and it's hard to understand, so please do ask questions, okay? All right. So, let's start reviewing uh, the concept of natural law. Um, natural law is one of the best-known teachings of St. Thomas. It consists in the philosophical doctrine that there are moral principles uh, that we can know by reasoning, that they're in us already, that we don't require divine revelation, strictly speaking, to know these moral, moral principles. Okay, like for example, that killing is wrong. I don't need God to come down to Mount Sinai to tell me that killing is wrong. That's something that we could figure out. Okay? It is certainly very good, and it's actually, Aquinas will say, it's morally necessary for God to, to reveal that, but had he not revealed it, we still would not be excused from killing people because it's something we should know. In fact, St. Paul says the same thing. All right? as, as I will say later on, I'll show, it's not just Aquinas who says this. It's St. It's Paul, it's the Bible, it's the Catholic Church. Okay? So, this philosophical doctrine originated in the first century BC uh, among the Stoics with Cicero and then a little later Seneca, okay? So these are pagans who are figuring out that there is a morality in us that we can just reason and discover it that way, right? So here's Cicero. Uh, here's a, the, the text of Cicero where this first appears, I think, in the history of philosophy. Now there are precursors to the natural law like Aristotle, uh, but Cicero is really the first one to nail it down as the natural law, okay? He says, for there is a true law, right reason. It is in conformity with nature, is diffused among all men, and is immutable and eternal. Its orders summon to duty. Its prohibitions turn away from offense. To replace it with a contrary law is a sacrilege. Failure to apply even one of its provisions is forbidden, no one can abrogate it entirely. So there is a law then for Cicero that is prior, more fundamental than what philosophers call positive law, which is the laws that we make, right? What people ordinarily call law, philosophers call positive law, because there's another law, at least another law, one other law, and that's the natural law, okay? So we're going to be talking about positive law and natural law today, okay? <clears throat> Now remember, Cicero is a pagan, pre-Christian philosopher. Okay, he had he did not have the benefit of divine revelation or of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And without those gifts, he still could figure this out. Now here's Saint Paul: For whosoever have sinned without the law. Now, what kind of law is he talking about? This is Romans, right there. So, I'm sorry? Mosaic. Mosaic law. That's right. So, the law of Moses. Those, uh, for, for whoever has sinned without the law shall perish without the law. 
and whosoever has sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So basically pagans will be judged according to their law, which is the natural law, right? And Jews according to their law, which is the Mosaic law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, who have not the law, do by nature those things that are of the law, these having not a law are a law to themselves. Is a reference to the natural law. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness to them, and their thoughts between themselves accusing or also defending one another. Okay? So here, this, this text has been uh, traditionally understood as a reference to the natural law, and the church has used it uh, to, to express the natural law. Now, then we, we skip to St. Thomas. Now, there are other, many, many authors in between, but we don't have, um, w w my talk is not on the natural law, so I have to kind of hurry up. Um, St. Thomas, who is really the greatest expositor of, of, of the natural law, defines it in this way, as the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. And by eternal law, he means God's ruling of the universe. Okay? And in another text, uh, not the Summa, on the Ten Commandments, he has a, a very nice uh, and simple definition. The natural law is nothing other than the light of understanding placed in us by God. Through it, we know that we must do, I'm sorry, what we must do and what we must avoid. God has given this light or law at the creation. Okay? <clears throat> so we have this, this uh, notion of right and wrong when we're born. It's, it's a gift God has given us, to, given us naturally. And here's uh, the church herself expressing the same teaching. Now, that Saint, uh, Pope Leo is, is just one example. There are hundreds of texts that I could have given you from the catechism, from... Uh, St. John Paul II, etc. But I thought this was a nice one that's not so well known. The natural law is written and engraved in the soul of each and every man because it is human reason ordaining him to do so and forbidding him to sin. But this command of human reason would not have the force of law if it were not the voice and interpreter of a higher reason, that's the eternal law, to which our spirit and our freedom must be submitted. Okay? All right, so that's the natural law, and a lot of Catholic apolog apologists and writers, especially today, like to cite the doctrine of the natural law to apply it to fields like bioethics and sexual ethics, homosexuality, abortion, euthanasia. Those are the typical topics uh, in the context of which you hear the natural law today among Catholics. But little do you hear of the natural law when it comes to worship. And what I'd like to do today is precisely that, is apply the natural law to worship. Because really, the natural law applies to all of our behavior. Okay? There are things that we know from reason as to how to behave, and some of those pertain to worship. Okay? And Aquinas is very explicit when it comes to this the relation between natural law and worship. It's, a, it's really a, an ignored area of study in St. Thomas. So, you recall from Vatican I that we can know from reason the existence of God. I mean, it is a Catholic dogma that God's existence can be proven with certainty with reason, right? The text of the Council says, God, the beginning and end of all things, can, from created things, be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason. And then there's a uh, condemnation of the opposite uh, thesis, which is the thesis that the one true God, our, our creator and Lord, cannot, through the things that are made, be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason. That, that's condemned as heretical, right? So we Catholics have to believe that that's possible to prove God's existence. Now, the church doesn't tell us which proofs um, are the ones that work, but most theologians would take as paradigmatical Aquinas' famous five ways, which are five different arguments or proofs for God's existence. Right? <clears throat> um, 
what interests us here is not which arguments work, but the fact that God's existence can be known through reason. Okay? Aquinas understands that notion that God's existence can be known through reason as including, as being coupled with our knowledge of our duty to worship Him. In other words, not only can man, through reason, know that God exists, but also that we, can, that we must worship Him. See, it's a practical knowledge. It's not just this theoretical knowledge that there is a higher being and that's it. Problem solved and now we can just continue living our lives the way we have been as atheists. No. We come to know God's existence and that implies an obligation to worship Him. And here's a little known text of St. Thomas, even though it's in the Summa. Natural reason tells man that he is subject to a higher being on account of the defects which he perceives in himself and in which he needs help and direction from someone above him. And whatever the superior being may be, it is known to all under the name God. Now, just as in natural things, the lower are naturally subject to the higher, so too it is the dictate of natural reason in accordance with man's natural inclination that he should render submission and honor according to his mode to that which is above man. You see? So our natural knowledge of God inclines us not just to know that God's, God's there, it's not just a theoretical knowledge, but it's a practical knowledge that we must worship him. <clears throat> and you know what? These pagan philosophers who came up with the natural law, they knew it. They were aware of the fact that there was a God or gods, because some of them were polytheistic, and that they have to worship them. Okay, so here's Plato, the famous Plato, in the dialogue called the Euthyphro. He eventually, towards the end of the dialogue, hypothesizes that the, well, it says here, the part of justice which has to do with the service of the gods constitutes piety and holiness. So in other words, what he's saying here is that piety, religious piety or um, worship, is something that we owe to God or gods out of justice. Okay? It's an obligation out of justice. Okay? Cicero, he says, religion is that part of the virtue of justice that offers care and reverence to a certain superior nature, which they call divine. And St. Thomas, he didn't know Plato's Euthyphro. He didn't have that text at hand. It was not translated into Latin uh, in his time. But he did have Cicero. And so he quotes Cicero as the, the authority on the matter, that we, we, our worship is something that belongs to justice, to the realm of justice. Okay? In fact, Aquinas has a very sophisticated understanding of the virtues and their parts or the sub sort of virtues that are related to each cardinal virtue. Okay? So, for example, studiousness belongs to temperance. Studiousness, well, uh, makes you avoid distractions and get to work, right? So that's part of temperance, and temperance is that virtue that um, helps us... Um, uh, helps us control the, what they call the concupiscible appetite, which is the desire for pleasure and such. So there are virtues that are subordinated to higher virtues. And Aquinas thinks that the virtue of worship or religio, religion, uh, is subordinated to that of justice. So that it's out of justice that we must worship God. Okay? And he's taking this from a pagan philosopher, which I think is remarkable. His whole theory of worship, religious worship, is philosophical, and it comes from the pagans, from a polytheist uh, of all things. So here is Aquinas on um, uh, the purpose of worship, or the goal of worship. Why do we worship? Why is this important? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I told you I'd throw a lot of texts at you. He says, it pertains to religion, or to the virtue of worship, to render due honor to someone, that is, to God. Also, to religion pertains doing certain things for the sake of divine reverence. Also, the good to which religion is ordered is to exhibit due honor to God. See, the thing is, he never has 
a full text where he explains this in detail, so I had to piece it together. It's, it's throughout his treatise on the virtue of religion. And here's my favorite. Now, due worship is paid to God insofar as certain acts whereby God is worshipped, such as the offering of sacrifices and so forth, are done out of reverence for God. Hence, it is evident that God is related to religion as its end or purpose. Further, religion order, orders man to God as to an end. Also, religion does those things that are directly and immediately ordered to divine honor. Divine worship is ordered primarily to exhibiting reverence to God. And finally, the end of divine worship is that, is that man may give glory to God. Okay, so you see the, the uh, focus of worship is God. The whole point is to give him what is his due. It's a matter of justice. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to insert a little footnote here because I'm going to talk about this later on. But note that the end of worship is not necessarily, um, I don't know, community or uh, one another or even my own sanctity, my own perfection. Rather, it is God giving him what we owe him. Okay? That's, I think, remarkable in St. Thomas. The pictures, by the way, they try to express in images what, what the content is in, you know, in the words. So I think in that picture you can see very clearly that in that liturgical service, the finality of worship is God. Right? Now he goes on exp explaining what the natural law requires in our worship. So, the need for religion and its rituals are a matter of natural law. St. Thomas says, The mode befitting to man is that he should employ sensible signs in order to signify anything because he derives his knowledge from sensibles. Hence, it is a dictate of natural reason that man should use certain sensibles by offering them to God in sign of the subjection and honor due to him, like those who make certain offerings to their Lord in recognition of his authority. Now, this is what we mean by sacrifice. And consequently, excuse me, consequently, the offering of sacrifice is of the natural law. Okay, so there's a lot in this text. He, he starts with a, an epistemology uh, of worship. Okay? Epistemo Does anyone know what epistemology is? Origin. What's that? The origin. the origin of what? Of knowledge, yes. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. Okay, uh, episteme in Greek means knowledge uh, or science. So it is a study of knowledge or knowledgeology, I suppose. Um, so he he has uh, in other parts of the Summa uh, quite a bit to say about epistemology. So here he's just kind of reviewing it, and his idea is one of the main principles. Of, of his epistemology is that there is nothing in the intellect which doesn't first come through the senses. Okay? So, nikil est in intellectu, nisi fuerit prius in sensu. All right? Nothing is in the intellect unless it were first in the senses. Everything comes to us through the senses. Now, the, the intellect can do more than the senses. The, so the senses can't uh, grasp um, general ideas. Okay? The senses can only grasp images. And then the intellect has to abstract the ideas from the images. But without those images, the intellect can't know anything. That's why a baby is born not knowing nothing. Okay? Even the natural law, which I said it, we were born with it. We were born with it, sort of. The intellect has to do a lot of work. You have to learn morality. You learn it through experience. Okay? So it's, it's more the capacity to learn morality that, that we have, all right? Now, how is this applicable to worship? Well, our worship has to come in through our senses. It is part of, man, part of man's nat nature that we express our, our inner devotion through physical signs, or what he calls sensibles, okay? So we, the natural law demands that we do physical things for God, to honor him, okay? Not that we can't, we don't, not that we shouldn't do anything interior, of course, that would be preposterous. 
Our worship should be primarily interior, but it has to come in first through the senses, okay? And therefore, it is necessary that in our worship we use, um, where is it? Certain sensibles by offering them to God. And the primary thing that Aquinas thinks we should offer to God is a sacrifice. And we're going to look into the notion of sacrifice later on, okay? So here you see our Pope um, using sensibles in worship. Even uh, decorating an altar is, is an example of that. Okay. Here's a text from the Summa Contra Gentiles. Among other things which pertain to worship, sacrifice may be seen to have a special place. For genuflections, prostrations, and other manifestations of this kind of honor may also be shown to men, though with a different intention than in regard to God. So you see what makes worship, uh, sacrifice special? Sacrifice can only be offered to God. A genuflection, you could offer that to a man. For example, the archbishop. Genuflect and kiss his ring, etc. Right? So other, signs of, other external signs of worship are not exclusively reserved to God, but sacrifice is. So that's what makes sacrifice special. In fact, he will, he will insist that sacrifice is the greatest exterior act of worship. Okay? But it is agreed right here, by any man that sacrifice should be offered to no person unless he is thought to be God or unless one pretends to think so. Now, external sacrifice is representative of true interior sacrifice by which the human mind offers itself to God. Indeed, our mind offers itself to God as the principle of its creation, the author of its actions, the end of its happiness. These attributes are, in fact, appropriate to the highest principle of things only. That's God. Therefore, man ought to offer sacrifice and worship only, uh, and worship only to God, the Most High, and not to any other kind of spiritual beings. Now, let's pause for a minute. We were talking about the natural law and that it applies to worship. Now, there's this thing about the natural law that it is not all-encompassing. It doesn't prescribe every single act that human beings can do. Okay? The natural law will only tell us so much, and then we have to fill, out, fill, fill in the details. For example, the natural law will say, when you drive, you shouldn't do harm to others. You shouldn't kill other people when you drive. Okay? But it doesn't tell you what side of the road you should drive on. That's something that it was decided by, well, our government. And as you know, in, in England, they do it the other way, right? Um, <clears throat> the correct way, says Father Boyle. <laughs> <clears throat> so, <laughs> so obviously that's not something dictated by, natural, by, by, uh, by the natural law. Um, the natural law only goes so far, right? So the same will be with worship. Here's a text from St. Thomas in general about the natural law. It must be noted that something may be derived from the natural law in two ways. First, as a conclusion from premises. Secondly, by way of determination of certain generalities. The first way is like when demonstrated conclusions are drawn from premises. So it'll be, uh, for example, um, thou shalt not kill. Okay, that's the general, um, actually, he, he gives that example. Oh, down here. I, I, I guess I'll read it when I get there. So, while the second mode is like when the craftsman needs to determine the general form of a house to some particular shape. Some things are therefore derived from the general principles of the natural law by way of conclusions. For example, that one must not kill may be derived as a conclusion from the principle that one should do harm to no man. While some are derived therefrom by way of determination. For example, the law of nature has it that the evildoer should be punished. But that he be punished in this or that way is a determination of the, nat the law of nature. Okay? So the, the general uh, idea here is that the natural law is very general. It gives you principles. And those principles have to be applied. So you can derive other things from the natural law. But that derivation could take place through positive law. Okay? Like the example of 
what direction we're going to drive in traffic, okay, or what side of the road. Now, that applies to worship, okay? The natural law doesn't prescribe every single detail of worship. Who has been here to a uh, Byzantine liturgy? Okay, great. Now, the first time I went to a Byzantine liturgy, I really asked myself, is this a Catholic church? I, I just couldn't even recognize it. In fact, there was Arabic writing and some icons, and wow, what's this, you know? <laughs> um, it was really shocking. But you see, our Lord didn't prescribe every single detail in worship. He didn't say what language the Mass should be in. He didn't say whether we should have an icon screen or, well, I mean, I'll let the clergy correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to use an example. Maybe that's not a good example. But the uh, point is, he did not prescribe every detail, right? So the natural law also doesn't prescribe every detail of our worship, okay? It prescribes that we have to worship God so that for the purpose of giving him his due, right, and that part of what we do externally has to be offer him a sacrifice, okay? But further than that, there's very little that the natural law prescribes. So here, here are a couple of texts from the Summa. It belongs to the di dictate of natural reason that man should do something through reverence for God, but that he should do this or that determinate thing does not belong to the dictate of natural reason, but is established by divine or human law. Okay? In divine and human law, those are positive laws. Okay, remember what positive law meant? What is positive law? What's that? Man-made law. But it could also be God-made law. For example, God in Sinai can tell us, can tell, told the Jews to do all sorts of rit ritual washings and things that are very complicated, and that's all positive law. It's not natural law, right? And it only applied to the Jews, right? <clears throat> so bo both divine and human law are instances of positive law. Second text. Certain things belong in general to the natural law, while their determination belongs to the positive law. Thus, the natural law requires that evildoers should be punished, but that this or that punishment should be inflicted on them as a matter determined by God or by man. Again, divine or human positive law. Unlike manner, the offering of sacrifice belongs in general to the natural law, and consequently, all are agreed on this point. But the determination of sacrifices is established by God or man, and this is the reason for their difference. So, can anyone tell me what that is a picture of? It's a, it's a medieval, a late medieval painting, but what is it a painting of? Maybe the first row can... Pardon? First fruits? Well, there is a little, there's a little lamb there. There's an altar back there with what seems to be... Yeah, it's a sacrifice. Yeah, it's a Jewish sacrifice. It's, it's, a, it's a painting of the temple, sacrifices of the temple. Huh? Their version. Yeah, it's a medieval version, right? A Western medieval version of it. Um, being that, our, uh, that God prescribed that kind of sacrifice for the Jews. So that's a specification of the natural law. The natural law says, offer me sacrifice, right? But then positive law, in this case, uh, Mosaic law says, offer me a lamb. Okay. And here's another important text from the commentary on Hebrews. The ceremonial precepts of the Old Testament are determinations of the precepts of the natural law and of the moral precepts. Therefore, in regard to what they had from the natural law, they were observed before the law without any precept. Okay, so I, let me back up a second here. St. Thomas thinks that there are three stages in the history of salvation with regard to law. There was a state, well, let's go from, from our time um, backwards in time. Currently, there is the new law. We are under the new law, which is the law of Christ. And he calls it that, the new law. Before Christ, the law in, that was in place was the old law, which is the Mosaic law. Before the Mosaic law, so from creation until Moses, there was what he calls the natural law, or the, the, the period of the natural law. 
where there was no law, no positive law given to mankind uh, or to the Jewish people, but people did what they thought was correct or didn't do it, but they knew what was correct. So he's talking about sacrifices in the stage or period of the natural law. Okay, in regard to what they had from the natural law, they were observed before the law without any precept. So they, did, they offered sacrifices each in his own way, as they understood to be better. Where the fact that something is offered to God in recognition of his creation and dominion is natural, but that he should be offered goats and heifers is a ceremonial precept of the Mosaic law. And this was done particularly because the main reason for rendering worship to God is to signify that whatever a man has, he received from God and that he depends on him for his entire perfection. So look at this mosaic here. It's an ancient mosaic de depicting Abel and Melchizedek offering their sacrifices to God. Of course, they didn't happen at the same time, but that mosaic unites two instances of the Old Testament where uh, people offered, just men offered sacrifice, pleasing to God. And this was before the old law. So these were not mosaic sacrifices. No. These were in the period of the natural law. Aquinas actually, uh, this is something I'm working on in my research, but it seems to me that Aquinas would take those instances as paradigmatic examples of natural religion, yeah, right. as opposed to, say, Cicero. Cicero is not a good example of a natural religion because they are already, uh, their understanding of religion is already, um, uh, let's say, deprived because of sin. But in these, in these cases, uh, Abel and Melchizedek, we have just men who knew God. They were monotheists and they offer a sacrifice pleasing to him. Anyway, I digress. I'm, I'm just very excited about research, so it's sort of a, my latest thought. Okay. <clears throat> so, another text on what the natural law prescribes. The obligation to offer sacrifice was not the same for those under the new or the old law as for those who were not under the law, meaning who were under the natural law. For those who are under the law are bound to offer certain def definite sacrifices according to the precepts of the law, whereas those who were not under the law were bound to perform certain outward actions in God's honor, as became those among whom they dwelt, but not definitely to this or that action. Okay, so it's a certain freedom, okay, which is not necessarily good because that can lead to corruptions in worship, right? Um, Pardon? Like cutting people's hearts. Yes, like human sacrifice, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, that was the case before the Mosaic Law when they simply had, they knew they had to offer sacrifice, but it had not been prescribed what kind. This is a, um, a, a mystical uh, painting where, uh, in the sense that it's, it's not historical, right? Um, they have a lamb on an altar, and it's symbolizing the mass, right? Uh, as, as the fulfillment of the Jewish sacrifice, right? The Jewish sacrifice, which, in, which had the unspotted lamb, is fulfilled in the New Testament when we immolate the lamb of God on the altar. Now, the sacraments, specifically the mass, is something that is a specification of the natural law through divine law. So divine law, in this case the new law, specifies the natural law and gives us the sacraments. As Augustine says, diverse sacraments suit different times. Now there, this, this um, goes back to the idea that there are Old Testament sacrifices, uh, sacraments rather, like circumcision, for example, and even the so-called sacraments of the natural law, okay? Um, but anyway, that's another talk. Consequently, just as under the state of the law of nature, man was moved by inward instinct and without any outward law to worship God, so also the sensible things to be employed in the worship of God were determined by inward instinct. 
But later on, it became necessary for a law to be given from without in order to signify more expressly the grace of Christ by which the human race is sanctified. And hence, it became necessary to determine things for men to make use of it in the sacraments. Okay? So the sacraments aren't this arbitrary uh, legislation that Christ gave us. He is not making something up. He is determining something that's already in our nature, our need for specific uh, external forms of worship. Okay? It's something that w- it's already in our nature, and he's just specifying it, determining, determining it to this or that, to baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, etc. Okay? So we should, I think we should, uh, it, it is very beneficial for us to understand the sacraments under that light as specifications of the natural law. So Christian worship really is a perfection of the natural law, should be seen as a perfection of the natural law. And this can help us reflect on perhaps how we should worship. Now here's where I'm starting to, um, to go beyond St. Thomas and doing my own reasoning, okay? There is this Catholic principle, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard, okay? That says that grace does not destroy nature, but presupposes it and perfects it, okay? Grazia non destruit naturam, sed supponit et perficit. Can anyone explain briefly what that means? Yes, please. Yeah, grace is built on nature. So when we receive grace, and here's the paradigmatic instance of a human being receiving grace, um, that grace does not undo what is natural to man. Rather, it brings it to fruition. It perfects it. It obviously takes it beyond what it is naturally capable of. Okay? But it builds on it. It doesn't destroy it. Right? That's, a, that's a, an enormously important Catholic principle which applies, well, to all of our faith. I've actually been meditating on this for years. So many different areas of our faith that I'm starting to realize, yeah, this is, grace does not destroy nature but perfects it. And the liturgy and our worship is one case. So our Christian worship presupposes our nature. The way we worship should be in accordance with the natural law. Not just divine positive law, which is great. I mean, obviously, it comes from God, but so does our nature. So we shouldn't have a worship that is not in accordance with our nature. Let me give you an example. And I don't mean to be unecumenical, but, for example, is Islam. Islam does not have any sacrifices. It is a very simple religion in that sense. Um, I study Aquinas' Arabic sources, and I have an enormous respect for these thinkers of Aroes, Maimonides, um, uh, Avicenna, Al-Ghazali. But, but I do recognize that in, in their worship, there is, there's definitely something missing, especially from, from the perspective of the natural law. There is no sacrifice there. So that worship really does not perfect our natural inclination to give to God some exterior sign of our submission to him. Okay. Also, Protestantism, in a sense, uh, Protestantism is, is very complex, and there are many forms. Um, I couldn't say this about Anglicans, for example, but most Protestant um, denominations don't have sacrifice, or they believe in the only one, in the one sacrifice that already happened, and they personally do not offer sacrifice because Christ did it once for all, once and for all, right? It doesn't seem like that would be in, constant, in consonance with our nature. We personally need to offer sacrifice. Well, not personally in the sense that I have to be the priest, but we have to witness a sacrifice and unite ourselves to that sacrifice. Our nature demands it. You see? So that's one, I think, application, important application of this idea that our worship must perfect our natural law. So our Christian worship must perfect the natural law. 
So to perfect the natural law, our prayer must be centered on sacrifice, which is the greatest act of worship. And notice too, we may run into, uh, into something similar. It's not just Muslims and Protestants. Also, um, in our own Catholic Mass, we can sometimes set things up visually and externally in such a way that we can maybe miss that aspect of sacrifice in the Mass. Okay? Um, perhaps think of it primarily in terms of, I don't know, a meal or a community gathering instead of what it essentially is, which is a sacrifice, right? I mean, we do have the sacrifice, so let's, let's bring that out in, in the liturgy. Let's be conscious of this, okay? And second, I think a second application, um, or conclusion rather, is that our worship, for it to be in accordance with the natural law, must be focused on God. Because what it essentially is, it is a giving to God what is this due, right? That's what the natural law prescribes, that we give to God out of justice what is this due. So, since that's the whole point why we worship, then our worship should be focused on God. Not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that other aspects of our worship are bad, but if we miss out on that, if we, if we relegate the theocentric focus of our worship as a secondary thing, then we are not really perfecting our nature and our natural inclination to give God his due. In other words, if you go to Mass and all you do is be with people and you don't consciously realize that you're worshiping God, I think there could be a problem there, okay? Because your nature demands that you give God his due, right? And here are some applications that follow from those conclusions. Perhaps it is good as we attend Mass, and I'm speaking from the perspective of a layman, um, to focus on the sacrifice of the Mass as the true essence of what is going on. That is essentially what's going on in the Mass. It is a sacrifice. Okay? And second, orientation and worship. Now, this is something that we as laymen don't have control over, um, except perhaps in our private devotions, but or to orient ourselves in worship. So that means that our bodies should be turned towards the Lord as we pray, okay? That doesn't mean that we can't turn around to walk out of the church or anything like that. There are people who, out of respect for God, will actually walk out of the church. I, in Mexico, I saw this a lot. People would walk out of the church like this. That's, that's a, an expression of piety. It's very, very uh, beautiful, I think, but uh, I'm not arguing for that. I'm simply saying that it is good for us to turn to the Lord in our prayers. I do it with my family when we pray the rosary or any other, like the Angelus at noon. We tend to all focus on some image um, to bring out the fact that it's, our worship is for Him. Okay? Rather than a circle and kind of... Uh, not that that's bad, but, but I as a father want to educate my children to be conscious of the orientation of worship and prayer, okay? Now, you, know, you probably have heard the phrase ad orientem, right? Which is the notion that churches traditionally are built in such a way that the altar, if you're, if you are, uh, if you're in the nave and you're facing the altar, then you are facing east, right? And there's a whole theology of why that is. I'll let the clergy explain that in their talks. Um, but essentially, that helps us uh, be very aware of the purpose of, of worship, which is to give God his due, okay? So here is what I have argued. Here's a summary of what I've said. I said that the natural law is not just for bioethics, sexual ethics, etc. That's a, that's a great use of the natural law, but it applies to most areas of our behavior, including religion and religious worship. 
And also recall that God's existence can be known naturally with certainty. And that's, I actually didn't quote Romans to that effect, but it is in Romans and in Vatican I. Also, the knowledge of God's existence is coupled with the knowledge of our duty to worship him. And I quoted Aquinas. Hence, religion is a matter of natural law. And by religion, I mean worship. Religion, even before Christianity, was known as a duty of justice towards God. We saw Cicero and Plato talk about this. Also, we saw that the end of worship or purpose of worship is the honor and glory of God. So there is a theocentric, God-centered focus in worship. That is what it is for. There may be other secondary ends, my sanctification, for example, but the primary thing here is to give God his due. We saw that the natural law prescribes some things and not others in worship. It prescribes sacrifices, for example, and other physical exterior uh, expressions. And it does not prescribe the details or the particulars concerning the rites. That's why there is a variety of rites in the church, for example. Okay? Sacrifice is the greatest exterior act of worship because it is the only exterior act that can only be given to God. And if you don't give it to God, it's idolatry. And it is necessary given our corporeal nature, that epistemology that we saw, where everything that is, ex- that, that is in our intellect has to come through the senses. We also saw that Christian worship and sacrifice uh, does not destroy but perfects the natural law. Or I should say it shouldn't void the natural law. We still have those natural inclinations. We, we're still obligated by the natural law to give God sacrifice and to give it to Him to have that orientation. So our divinely instituted sacraments shouldn't violate that, that nature, that human nature. And as a conclusion, I said that to fulfill the natural law, our worship must be focused on sacrifice and must be God-oriented. Oh.